So I think, you know, what I, w what I would ask you is, um, is Jesus God, Steve? And, and if so, uh, why do we believe that? And why should we believe that any more than, say, <laughs> that some, some of the other views that he was a spiritual man or, um, you know, an exalted being, but not, but not really actual, actually God, you know? Yeah. What would you say to that? If somebody, if, if somebody said to you, why, why should I believe Jesus is God, you know? Well, uh, my belief is that if we're going to have any thoughts about Jesus, we might as well follow the records rather than making it up as we go along. You know, um, it's like if you wanted to know about George Washington, I, I suppose to know who he was, you probably should look at the historical records rather than just make something up off the top of your head. And for someone to make Jesus anything other than what he claimed to be is basically coming up with a theory that's off the top of their head. And uh, I, I'd much rather, in my thinking, be bound to the evidence and go with what the, what the scriptures say, which, of course, a lot of people think when you say the scriptures, you're just talking about a book you believe because it's a religious book and you happen to believe that religion. But uh, obviously I'm thinking of them as the historical records that happen to be included in the, what we call the Bible, you know. But, but Jesus... Uh, you know, what What Jesus claimed to be is what I'm going to take him to be if, or nothing. You know, I, I, I can't just make up an alternative view and say, I think there's some credibility to this uh, because I don't have any information about him at all except what I have <coughs> on record. In, in the New Testament? Yeah, well, I mean, there's obviously some reference to him outside the New Testament, but it doesn't really address those issues. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, we have, I mean, we have got the writings of um, Josephus, for example, and other you know, extra biblical writings that would affirm, you know, that he, there was a, 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 you know, a holy man and a spiritual man who went around and, you know, doing miracles and, and so forth and yeah. different views on him. But you, what, what, what you're actually saying is, and this gets challenged as you know, as well, because people do think, well, you know, you're only talking about the Bible, but you would say that because you're a Christian, which, which you know, it tends to suggest they don't really either see or uh, accept the historical documents of the gospel. Well, because they're the best records we have of historical information, you know, from that period mm. and the most complete. <clears throat> and they're, they come from the people who were there, you know. I mean, we don't have any historical records about other uh, ancient people <coughs> that were written by people who hung out with them. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think we have the best evidence uh, of historical fact that's available right there in the gospels. They agree with everything external to them that the, you know, we do have historical statements about Jesus from other sources like Josephus and others, but they don't tell us much, but what the gospels tell us are not contradicted by those things. So in other words, we have in the Gospels rather comprehensive records, which connect at certain points with other historical records, not on all points, but on all the points where they connect, they're confirmed rather than disconfirmed. Uh, so, I mean, what, what would there be about? I would just say, what would be the reason for doubting them? Sure. You know, if someone says, if someone says, well, I don't, I don't believe the Gospels that they're true, I'd say, well, okay. Do you believe the? Do you believe anything you read in the newspapers? Do you believe anything you read in a textbook about history? Why do you believe those? I mean, what would you find in the Gospels that would give you warrant to disbelieve them? Yeah, you know, when people tell you, I mean, if I tell you something about my life, you can say, well, I don't believe you, Steve. Well, you don't have to believe me, but what would be the reason for that? You usually don't just call people liars just because you feel like it that day uh, you got to figure is this person an honest person do they have competence to speak do they know what they're talking about I mean if somebody knows what they're talking about and they're honest you can trust what they say now if they're honest but don't know what they're talking about you can't necessarily trust what they say or if they're if they if they do know what they're talking about but they're not honest you can't but if you got both those things honesty and competence then there's not really the slightest reason to doubt them now Certainly, there's evidence that they were honest. They were willing to die for their story. That's a pretty good evidence of honesty. And as far as competence, well, a lot of them were there. They saw it happen. Some rather unforgettable things they witnessed. Uh, so I don't really see how there'd be any serious reason to doubt them. But if someone has a reason to doubt them, I'm willing to hear it. But usually, 
people don't doubt them because they have reasons to doubt them. They doubt them just because they want to doubt them. Yeah. And I'm, you know, my position would be, well, I think we should believe or doubt things as per the evidence. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, I want to, which I did. I mean, I, 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 there are Christians out there who believe without having really um, researched it much, but I actually did some research into the veracity of the scriptures and looked at the gospels, how we, how we you know, obtained the gospels today and, you know, how we got the copies and the reliability of them and everything else and was kind of amazed that they stood up so well because there's so much, uh, so many attacks on them that uh, they're all made up, they're doctored, and the, these so-called, you know, errors and changes turned out to be so minimal and didn't affect anything remotely of substance. Right. Uh, you know, um, but I, I, you know, but I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and we were getting down this rabbit trail, and then he still wouldn't believe, though, because his argument was, uh, he, and he quoted some some guy he respected a lot, said, extreme, extreme claims require ex extreme evidence, and, and I... Yeah, that's... And that's that's exactly what the atheists always say. Actually, what they say is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's it. Someone says extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, I would say that's probably true. The real question is how extraordinary are the claims we're asked to, to accept and how extraordinary is the evidence? I mean, extraordinary means beyond the ordinary. Okay, well, certainly to believe that there's a God, is that extraordinary to believe that? Or is it more extraordinary to deny that there's a God? Certainly throughout history, most thinking people have believed that there's a God of some kind. It's the, it's, it's the modern minority who are skeptical about that. I mean, atheists are still a pretty small percentage of the population. So it sounds like for someone to say there's no God is an extraordinary claim. I'd like to see their extraordinary evidence for that. To say there's a God is not extraordinary because people have said that fairly universally throughout history. They don't all have the same opinions about the description of that God or the activities of that God, but that there is a God or gods has been almost a universal view of humanity until very modern times. I mean, there's always been some skeptics, of course, but <clears throat> the official view held by most thinking people, uh, and especially in Western civilization the past 2,000 years, is that there's a God and that Christianity is true. And if there's a God, there's no reason why Christianity would be not likely true. Uh, I mean, what does Christianity claim? Christianity claims that God visited us so that we could get to know him. And he proved himself by showing miraculous things, by telling future things that no man would know, by dying and rising from the dead, and, uh, and that being witnessed by a great number of people, some of whom recorded it. So to me, okay, how, how extraordinary is that? Well, it's unique, but everyday things happen that are unique. That is, things happen every day that never are going to happen again. Everything that occurs is a unique event. So the real question is, how outrageous is it for me to believe that that particular unique event occurred? Well, depending on your prejudices. If you believe, out of sheer prejudice, because that's all you could use, if you believe that miracles never occur, uh, and that there's no supernatural and there's no God, then, of course, everything in the, in the story of Jesus is incredible because they presuppose that there's a God that's supernatural and that Jesus came from God. So if your worldview uh, automatically, a priori, rules out all supernatural things, then, then it is asking you to believe too much. The thing is, that worldview is the extraordinary thing. The worldview that says there's nothing but nature, that all things came about, all the design in the universe, everything came from nothing and organized itself, and including into beings like ourselves who are rational, uh, intelligent beings, that this all happened just from the, you know, atoms uh, crashing against each other in the proper manner. To me, that's, a, that's an extremely extraordinary claim, and it certainly is the minority view, historically, of thinking people. So uh, if, if I take the view that's, that's the, whether whether correct or not, it is the majority view throughout history of people that there is uh, a supernatural, supernatural being that created things. And, I, and that's a very reasonable explanation of, of visible evidence, unless I'm prejudiced against it. Okay. Then I'm not really making a very extraordinary claim at all when I say this God who made us was interested in communicating with us, was interested in us, and came down to make himself known to us. Now, for those who don't believe in any supernatural, that just sounds like a fairy tale. I would ask them the question, why don't they believe in a supernatural? 
is there some scientific proof that there's no supernatural? Is there some scientific reason, some historical discovery that somehow inclines us to have to believe there's no supernatural? I've never heard of one. Uh, and as a matter of fact, an awful lot of highly educated people still believe in God. Probably the majority still do, of one kind or another, whether they're Muslim or Christian or Jewish or something else. Yeah. So, in other words, what are, the, what are you calling an extraordinary claim? If you're saying a unique event is claimed, well, that's not extraordinary at all. Uh, today, in the course of my day, I'm going to do many things I'll never do again. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to drive to a certain place that I might never drive to again. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to experience traffic patterns that will never be exactly the same again. No two events are exactly alike. So the real question is not how often do these things happen. The question is, what is the likelihood that these things might happen, given the worldview that we have? Now, if I believe in God, as most people have throughout history, then, then there's nothing particularly unlikely about God doing the things that we read about. The real, the real unlikeliness is that they wouldn't happen, and yet the people who were there thought they did, and the people who recorded it thought they happened. Uh, now, that, that would be something extraordinary, because I don't know of very many cases of mass hallucinations. Uh, in fact, I don't, think, I don't think there are such things as mass hallucinations. I so, think one of the arguments against whatever, uh, it's a ridiculous argument, an absurd argument in my, my view, but it is one of the arguments that some people put forward for the 500 plus sightings of the resurrected Jesus Christ, isn't it? Well, I, I, some people may suggest it, but I don't think anyone really believes it. No. Because a hallucination by... by definition is something that takes place inside the subjective head of an individual. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. There's not such thing as mass hallucinations. There might be <laughs> there, there might be 500 people experiencing hallucinations at the same time, but they won't be the same one. Well, quite, yeah. You so, I mean, this is the audience. Excuse me. So, in other words, uh, making, making me have to defend something that as an extraordinary claim, I want to first of all establish why we're calling this an extraordinary claim. Um, it's it's a unique claim, but is it unlikely? How how could you know whether it's unlikely until you know what the background of the universe is? Is there a God there? Is there no God there? The person who says there is a God at least has some evidence because there are occasions where many, many people have claimed that God did something or occurred, uh, you know, appeared to them or, or responded in a certain way to them. Maybe these, these are not conclusive proofs to anyone who wasn't there, but there certainly are a lot of people saying, yeah, I've, you know, I've encountered events that, that were apparently supernatural. Now, the naturalist can say, well, they weren't supernatural. They, were, they, they can be naturally explained. Well, go for it. Explain them then. But, but even if you can explain something naturally, it doesn't mean that your natural explanation was the correct one. I mean, people often think intuitively, but they're not very smart when they think this way, that now that scientists tend to believe that evolution is the way that things have happened, and they might even consider it a proven fact, that somehow this has ruled out God. But people who think clearly would never say that, and don't, because there might be a God and evolution too. In other words, just because something that was once attributed strictly to God has now been explained in a naturalistic way, doesn't mean that God has somehow been ruled out. Couldn't God use evolution if he wished? The, real, the, the, the effort to disprove the existence of God is a fool's errand. You can't disprove something. You can't prove a, a universal negative. And, of course, Richard Dawkins would say something like, yeah, yeah, well, you can't disprove that there's a flying spaghetti monster either. And he says, I don't believe in this flying spaghetti monster. I don't believe in God because they haven't been proven. Well, but the two don't stand on exactly the same... Uh, you know, evidential basis. No one has ever claimed to have encountered a flying spaghetti monster. And there's no reason that a flying spaghetti monster would be an explanation of the things we're trying to explain, uh, you know. Uh, we're trying to explain the origin of intelligence. We're trying to explain the origin of consciousness. We're trying to explain the origin of life, the origin of organization, uh, of DNA, of information. These are things that you don't need a flying spaghetti monster even, even the presence or absence of one wouldn't make a difference in, in discussing these questions. Yeah. But the presence of a, of a superhuman intelligence mm. that brought things into existence is certainly one of the rational possibilities. 
that would have to be considered when looking at the question. And since there are a great number of people throughout history who believe that they have, you know, they can testify to have had encounters with God, and I'm not yet aware of anyone who's claimed to meet a flying spaghetti monster, it's a, it's a foolish analogy, you know. Well, uh, I don't believe probably, in spaghetti monster either. You, you probably know from reading Dawkins' uh, writings. I mean, he's not a, he's not a, a particularly intelligent thinker. I mean, he relies a lot on ridicule and mass consensus and silly jokes and you know a, a, a sort of a following who who are, yeah. like to scoff rather rather than do any real thinking. I mean, I've got a. Are you do you know John Lennox? Yeah, oh yeah, he's great. Yeah, he, he's from the same part of the world as I'm from. He's from Northern Ireland, and he he, he wrote a book called uh, "Gunning for God." Uh, I've read it. Yeah, it's a, it is a brilliant book, isn't it? In, ter- in, it is. ter- in terms of like you know dissecting you know Dawkins, you know, and you know, people seem to think that you know if you're a Christian and you believe you know you, you, that believing is somehow blind faith, but you know uh, uh, Lennox is a math professor as well as a uh, you know at the same uh, Oxford University as. Um, Dawkins. Dawkins. So you know, there's the. It's not like you know he, that he's a whip behind Dawkins in any particular uh, intelligence skills. But that that was an excellent yeah. breakdowns a lot of that. But okay, let's uh, we'll try and get we'll get into this the particular topic. It's a topic I find fascinating. That, you know, it's you know I remember a couple of years before before I was converted, I said to a friend of mine, you know, I think I think I might be obsessed with you know the idea of you know God you know in 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 the form of a man. Um, in Jesus Christ, I was just meditating on it, Steve, and I just found it mind blowing. It, it was incredibly fascinating to me. He, he said, "There's worse things you can be obsessed with." <laughs> he was, a, he was a, yeah. um, But obviously, there, you know, this was a problem for the, you know, for the for the Jews, uh, those in the early church who rejected Christ. It's certainly a problem for uh, uh, Muslims. Mm-hmm. So this is what we, this would fall into the category. Um, of an extraordinary claim. My view is, if he's God, then why wouldn't he be able to come into the, his creation as a man, in terms of what he's capable of doing? But um, th- it does seem to be that people really struggle with the idea of, you know, that this, you know, omniscient, omnipotent, you know, creator God that we're talking about, you know, it just, it, it just seems too big that he would somehow, you know, come into the form of being a man. I mean, what would you say to this whole, whole idea of uh, uh, God becoming a man? Well, as you said, if there is a God, and that's our starting point, then we don't know the limitations of what he can or cannot do. Uh, but there's, since he can create the universe and he can create life and he can do you know, many things that we can't imagine how they otherwise would be done, we certainly cannot rule out that he could become a man if he wished. Of course, Christian theology teaches that God can do everything, and therefore becoming a man is not a, not a problem to him. Uh, it's not a problem to him for a virgin to be made to conceive. It's not a problem for him for a dead man to rise. It's not a problem to him. And and we have many cases in the Old Testament before Jesus came to earth where God appeared in various forms to men. Uh, He appeared in a human form sometimes. In Genesis 18, it says that God appeared to Abraham. And Abraham looked up and saw three men coming to him. Now, some people want to make that the Trinity, but as you read the story, it's clear that one of those men was God appearing to him. And the other two were angels. Now, they weren't men, but they were in human form. It was God and two angels who appeared to Abram in order to relate with him man to man. They took on a human form. And this happened other places, too. Jacob wrestled all night with a man that is identified and he recognized later as God. Um, But then there's also cases where God appeared in other ways, in a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire leading the children of Israel. Uh, God was in there. Uh, That was the Shekinah glory of God. He appeared to Moses in a burning bush. Uh, God can appear any way he wants to on earth to people if he wants to. He's an invisible God, but that doesn't mean he can't make himself visible. It's obvious that Jesus, after his resurrection, was able to make himself invisible sometimes because he just disappeared from the presence of the disciples. I mean, I think... Yeah, I was going to say it doesn't appear that the transition from visibility to invisibility or from material to immaterial, is a difficult thing for God. So if he wants to become a man, then I can't imagine anyone who could forbid it or could say that that's simply beyond the, the, the pale of the things God can do. 
I mean, I think, you know, um, looking at the scriptures, I mean, when, when God appeared um, to Abraham and he wrestled with Jacob, Jacob um, correct me if I'm wrong, this is a, he appeared as this would be described as a theophany. Yeah. Correct. So, but, you know, but what the Jews seemed to struggle with and the rabbis and Sam Hidden who reject Jesus was that he actually had come through, you know, the birth canal as actual flesh and blood and had yeah. become an actual man. They really sort of, because they seemed to struggle with this concept, you know. They struggle with it because they don't think it did happen. But it's hard to know why they would say it couldn't happen. The God that the Jews believed in and the God that the Muslims believe in is the creator of all things. You know, if he could create a man out of, out of dust and breathe life into him, make him a living creature, why couldn't God put himself into such a body of dust? I mean, the, the question really can't real. I mean, for anyone who believes there's a God who's Muslim or Jew or Christian or whatever, anyone who believes in an omnipotent God, the question can never be, is it possible? for God to do this. The real question is, did he do it? Sure. Because uh, with God, nothing is impossible. The real question is not, could God do it? We could say, could God uh, make me, uh, you know, jump uh, a thousand yards in a uh, standing broad jump? Well, he could, but he never has. You know, I mean, there's anything God could do, but to claim that it happened is a different issue. Um, so the real issue is, do we have reason to believe that this did happen? Now, what we know and what everybody knows who pays attention to history, even if they're not a believer, even if, they're not, if they don't even believe in God, they know that a man appeared in history who we, regard, who we call Jesus, Christ, that he made a big splash in Israel by doing things which most people believe were miracles. Uh, walking on water, turning water to wine, uh, stopping the weather by commanding it to stop, and also by healing all kinds of sicknesses, and even casting demons out of people, and the demons themselves uh, seem to acknowledge who he was as well. Now, these are the things that happened. The explanation of them is then incumbent upon us to come up with. Now, uh, a, non, uh, a non-believer could say, well, these things, uh, you, know, you know, a magician can fake these kinds of things. So Jesus was maybe a magician who faked them. Uh, or, or maybe the, oh, pardon? I said he did get accused of being a sorcerer as well, didn't he? That's exact, well, that's exactly what the Talmud calls him. Yeah. You know, the, Jews, the Jews called him one in his lifetime, and the Talmud says that they called him that too. Uh, so, tro- I mean, yeah. Out of troublemaker. Yeah, troublemaker to be sure. Well, you know, the Talmud is very much anti-Christian and anti-Christ, but it, but it inadvertently confirms that Jesus did extraordinary things exactly. because it, it has to refer to him as a sorcerer who deceived the people with his sorcery. Well, sorcery is simply a magic. So Jesus' actions, even by his enemies, had to explain beyond natural means. They, they, they decided it was magic. Jesus said, no, uh, the Father who sent me is doing these works through me. So we can believe him or his critics. Now, once again, when it comes to believing someone's credibility, it has a lot to do with establishing what kind of character they are. Do they have, uh, are, are they deluded? Or do they know, are they you know, sober-minded? Are they uh, deceivers? <clears throat> what evidence is there of that? Are they, are they getting some benefit from deceiving people, like making money off them or, you know, seducing women by, by claiming to be something that, that uh, they're not? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I can't think of anything that would lead Jesus to lie about these things. What did he get out of it? He didn't, get, he didn't make money. He didn't uh, ever marry. He didn't. Uh, he just got crucified, and he knew well in advance that that was what was going to happen because he predicted it several times. So, what exactly was in it for him I'm to deceive saying, people? The, the same could be said of his followers, and many of them died similar or you know worse deaths because you know there uh-huh. seems to be an unreasonable level of cynicism brought to some of the claims uh, of his followers as well, the apostles. And you think? I mean, we're talking to a guy. I said, well. Well, why would they lie? You know, they weren't making any money. I mean, they ended up with brutal deaths, many of them. I mean, there's just no, yeah. there's no, you know, reasonable reason why they would lie. But sorry to interrupt you, Steve. Well, the atheist usually answers that this way. I was interviewed on an atheist uh, webcast a long time ago, and I, I brought up the fact that the apostles were willing to die for their testimony. <clears throat> and the host said, well, that's no big thing. There's Muslims willing to die for their beliefs, too. Uh, they blow themselves up. 
for their beliefs. That doesn't mean their beliefs are right. But my response was, you've missed my whole statement. I didn't say these people died for their beliefs. They died for their testimony. Mm -hmm. A testimony is a, a witness who saw something and bears testimony to it in court, for example. Uh, if, it's, if he hasn't seen anything, he's not a, he's not a witness. <clears throat> they bore witness to what they saw. They saw the life of Jesus, they saw the death of Jesus, and they saw him after he rose from the dead, had encounters with him, and that's what they testified to. Now, uh, you know, a Christian in the second or third century might die for his beliefs, like a Muslim might die for his beliefs, or anyone might die for his beliefs, because a Christian in the second century hasn't seen Jesus. They don't have anything they can testify to. They just believe what they've been told. But the apostles did see, and they testified to what they saw. And for their testimony, they were put to death. There's a world of difference between dying for something you claim you saw and witnessed and touched and, and lived with, on the one hand, and dying for some set of beliefs that's been passed down to you over the centuries, as, as a Christian martyr or a Muslim martyr might say. So, I mean, we're not looking at a parallel there. Yeah, it's a massive. Uh, the disciples. Yeah, I mean, it's like, a, it's like if a person bore witness in court to something and someone said, it took him out in the back uh, alley and put a gun to his head, now you're going to have to change your testimony to that. He said, I'm not going to change. Blow my brains out if you want to. I'm going to tell what's true. You know, I mean, if a person <coughs> claims they saw something and they won't renege even when they're threatened with death for it, there's a good evidence that they really believe they saw it. Now, of course, the view that it's a hallucination, that's one of the views out there, too. But as I said, there's too many people having this alleged hallucination. And uh, how, could, how could they all get on the same page with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and, and furthermore, people can sometimes be convinced that they saw something that they didn't. And this is often pointed out, too. Like that video on YouTube of the gorilla suit, the guy in the gorilla suit, these, his kids are all passing a basketball around. Do you ever see that one? No, I haven't seen it's, it's amazing evidence that you don't see things properly sometimes because there's a video on YouTube of these, uh, like, oh, might be five or six uh, college age kids, and they're tossing a, a basketball to each other in random fashion as they're standing in a, in a random configuration, throwing it around. And you watch it for a few minutes. And at the end, it stops and it says, did you see the gorilla? And, and you didn't. And so they, they run it by again in slow motion. And lo and behold, a guy in a gorilla suit walks right through the, <coughs> the crowd. And, right. and, uh, and you didn't see it right, right. for some reason. I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's not camouflaged at all. He's, he's, he's conspicuous. He's right through the middle. For some reason, most people do not see that. And, uh, and yet when you play the tape slower... You can say, oh, there he is. Yeah, why didn't I see that when it happened? He doesn't run through. He just walks through. So it's a bizarre kind of an experiment to show that, you know, you don't always see what's really there. Yeah, and different people, different people can have slightly different takes on the same story. And this is, this is, and obviously you know that the Gospels have come under criticism for this very thing because there's slightly different accounts here and there. But that would actually make it, make it more believable because that is actually natural and normal and shows that there's there's evidence of no collusion, which would be much more uh, worrying for someone trying to drive a narrative. The, it's honest, they can see slightly different accounts, and we would expect that to happen as a human experience, recording uh, each person recording their own accounts, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you if you read four different historical accounts about a man's life, they're, uh, they're essentially in agreement with each other, though the witnesses can't remember if this happened six days later or seven days later yeah. <clears throat> than the previous event. I mean... Uh, or those kind the, of differences, those kind of differences, just show that they didn't get together to put the story together uh, artificially. Exactly. And okay, we'll we'll all tell it this way because no one's going to believe us if we can't back each other up, you know. Yeah, yeah. But but they didn't they didn't apparently <laughs> have any effort to that. What's interesting about the Gospels, the way they're written, and, and many scholars have noticed this, is that they they include the the miraculous elements among this uh, among the non miraculous elements in the story. In a very artless fashion, it's not like they're trying to build up to, you know, to impressing you with a big thing. In fact, some of the, the greatest miracles, it, they tell with great brevity, you know. They just say Jesus touched him and he was healed. And then it goes on to the next story. Yeah. And here, what happened is a guy was healed of leprosy. Yeah. A guy was healed of total blindness. And, it, you know, they just mention it and they, they don't elaborate. They don't explain. Uh, it's certainly someone writing mythology would want to build this up to a big thing. 
And even, even the resurrection of Christ, the greatest miracle recorded in all four Gospels, is not recorded as occurring, but it's only uh, the, the tomb is found empty, and there are appearances of Christ, but no one, there's no record of Jesus waking up from the dead, walking out of the tomb. As someone writing mythology, that'd be the big, that'd be the climax of the story. You'd, you'd have all kinds of drama involved in there. Why is that? And, I never thought of it. That. Why is that, do you think? Because they couldn't write what they didn't know. They no one saw it. They, they were being honest. I mean, they could have made something. I'm, I'm wondering why God did it that way with the resurrection. Because he, did, you know, he, maybe he just, you know, because he, he, you're right. He just found the tomb empty, and he could have made. He could have had waited until there was a few of them around and, and burst out of there, couldn't he? Yeah, yeah, he could have. And I think, I mean, I mean, just this phenomenon I'm talking about is perhaps the reason why he did it that way. He said, "Listen, my people are not going to make stuff up." They're going to have the evidence. They're going to see the tomb is empty. There's no good reason why that tomb would get empty if Jesus didn't wake up and come out of it because the disciples would have no motive for stealing the body, especially for endangering their lives to overcome the guards in a, in a conflict. Uh, why? What did they gain by it? Uh, they, they had, there's no reason to believe that the disciples had any interest whatsoever in starting a religion or, or after Jesus was dead saying, hey, let's, let's try to pretend like he's back, you know. Yeah. Uh, there, there's no motivation can be imagined that ever was manifested in their lives. But also the, the enemies of Christ wouldn't have any motive to do it. I mean, if they did, if the Jews or the Romans actually stole the body, which maybe they would have a motive to do, but they would no longer have that motive to keep it hidden once the disciples started claiming Jesus rose from the dead. The quickest way to prove the disciples were wrong for the Jews or the Romans who wanted to prove them wrong would be simply to produce the, the corpse. Yeah. If they had taken it, they'd know where to find it. But they never did it. They never. No one ever suggested, no, we took the body at somewhere else. In fact, what they, what what the, the account that went around was, the high priests paid the soldiers to, to lie and say that the disciples had stolen the body. But again, no one claims to have seen it. In fact, they were told to say, while we were asleep, the disciples stole the body. Well, how can you be sure what happened when you're asleep? Right. You wake up and there's no body. You, you assume maybe the disciples stole it, but is this reasonable? How could they do it when there's guards at the tomb? How could they, what would they do with it afterwards? How would they keep it hidden? Uh, why would they want to even? Yeah, you know, we are so familiar with the Christian claim that Jesus rose from the dead that it might seem, well, it's, you know, that's just, that's just a story that worked for them, you know. But when you think, you know, why would someone come up with a story like that? They didn't have a religion that was expecting someone to rise from the dead. No. Uh, they didn't. Even the disciples didn't expect him to rise from no, the dead. They were cowering in fear, weren't they? The whole, the, the whole sort of the wheels had come off. Their leader had died. They thought, right, that's it. Now. Yeah. And uh, they went cowering and hiding and fearing for their lives. And they thought that's the end of the party, really, isn't it? That's right. That's uh, plus, uh, plus, as you know, the you know the Jews certainly or the Romans certainly didn't have any motivation, you know, with uh, the with the whole thing with the body because. They actually knew the rumor about him rising, and they colluded. To, that's the reason that they guarded the, the tombstone, so that no one could claim that he right. couldn't come in and steal his body and claim that he had risen and, and sort of start a, a movement and a marker from sort of type movement, you know? Well, here's the facts. I think everyone will agree, even the, even the non-believers of, of the time, that Jesus' tomb was found empty. The enemies couldn't go there and find the body to prove the disciples were lying. The tomb was empty. And so that's, that's just an objective fact. Jesus was buried. Three days later, his tomb was empty. There were some people claiming he'd risen from the dead, and a lot of people didn't want to believe it. But, but as far as what really did cause the tomb to be empty, we've just got to survey the very possibilities. And obviously, if he didn't rise from the dead, then somebody had to, you know, had to move the body. But who did? If it was someone not favorable toward Jesus, like I said, or toward Christianity, they would uh, have exposed the, the hoax when the disciples began to say he's risen. They'd say, no, we have his body right over here. Or even if they had taken the body and destroyed it, they would have at least let that be known. No, we took his body. You know, the reason you didn't find the body in the tomb is because we took it and we burned it or something. I mean, no one ever made claims like that. They always came up with something else because those claims could not be made. So the only thing that they were left with, even the enemies, were that, well, the disciples must have stolen it. But that's, that's so problematic because, first of all, the disciples were not armed soldiers. They were fishermen and tax collectors and things like that. <clears throat> so they weren't trained fighters. 
And the soldiers that were placed at the tomb were placed there because they expected the disciples to try to do it. So they must have put a, a force there that was, they felt, large enough to repel such an uh, attempt. And even if the disciples did turn up with overwhelming force and did defeat the guards, they could not do so without a fight, without, without injuries. The guards didn't have any injuries. You know, they couldn't claim, look, here's where I got cut, trying to defend the body from the disciples. Yeah, sure. They just said, they said, no, when we slept, they took it, you know. In other words, there was no sign of a struggle that they could even point to. Yeah. And yet the guards would not let the body be taken by a, an army of disciples without, you know, fighting and getting injured and being defeated. Even, so there's yeah, yeah. No, no evidence of that at all. Even the whole idea of the, you know, Centurions falling asleep in the job, you know, that's the equivalent of, you know, the British SAS, uh, you know, uh, doing the same thing. It wouldn't happen. Exactly. Um, yeah, if a sentry falls asleep at his post, that's usually a capital offense, in, you know, and, and the Romans viewed it that way, too. In fact, later in the book of Acts, in chapter 12 of Acts, one of the apostles is arrested. Peter is put in jail, and he's guarded by four soldiers. And in the middle of the night, an angel comes while they're, the soldier is sleeping, and, and lets him go. Well, the next morning, the authorities found out that the soldiers had lost him and ordered them to be put to death. That was the Roman custom. Mm -hmm. You know, the soldier, you lose you lose what you're guarding, it's it's on your head, you know? Yeah. And so we know that this is what the Romans did. And, you know, are, are the soldiers then going to say, yeah, we, uh, you know, we just kind of flubbed it up and we lost him? Well, that's that's their head. You know, they'd be much more uh, better served if they're going to lie about things to say, we got injured. We were fighting. We, there were just too many of them. You know, they, they outnumbered us three to one. And so we, sure, we took a beating, but they, but they, they spared our lives and they took the body. Well, where's this evidence that they took a beating? Where's the wounds? Where's the bruises? Where's the cuts in the blood and the, the signs of a scuffle? You know, where'd that, there's no one ever appealed to such things because they weren't there. Yeah, it's incredible when you look at, as I say, when you look at the veracity of the Gospels and when you look at the, the whole resurrection, it is incredible how, um, if you're honest, um, just, how, just how strong it is. And as I say, when I researched it probably about three, three years, three and a half years ago, because there was so many, you know, we live in a culture at the minute, Steve, of conspiracies. They're everywhere. Yeah. And I think the enemy has, you know, taken conspiracies and, and you know, made, made good good work of it with the whole Christian thing because there are so many, you know, conspiracies about, you know, scriptures being doctored and we don't know this and we don't know that and all these conspiracies. But when you do actually go and do the rabbit trail and when you look at do the research properly, I was astounded. I thought, wow, you know, and God certainly left a very strong uh, trail for people to follow that stands up. Well, yeah. And that's another way in which the claims of Christianity differ from those of other religions. I mean, Muhammad claims that the angel Gabriel came and gave him the Quran, but no one was there at the time. Yeah. And and you could never hope to find archaeological evidence of such a meeting. Uh, I mean, there's just nothing, there's no way that can be tested. You're just asked to believe it. And if, uh, and the same thing is true of Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon church. He claims he had a private meeting with God in the woods, and later an angel came and showed him gold plates, which he saw and translate, but but where are they now? Well, they're not they're not available. The angel took them back and, and hit them again. So you can't verify any of the claims of these groups. But virtually any claim that Christians have made about Christ is is verifiable, in uh, by normal ways of verifying historical claims. Now again, your atheist friend says, but extraordinary claims need extraordinary verification, extraordinary proof. And I'd say, well, I think we have that. What other ancient events do we have so many different witnesses of from many sources? Those who are sympathetic and those who are unsympathetic. Uh, the Romans, the Jews, and the Christians, all having different, uh, you know, different approaches to the story of Christ, all in their histories record the same essential story. Uh, so, I mean, there's plenty of evidence that it happened historically. And if we would say, well... Uh, we don't believe that it happened. Well, you know, a person is not forced to believe anything. No one will believe what they've determined they won't believe. That's, it's really your choice. But, but if a person doesn't believe in Jesus and the story of Jesus, then they have to explain why they believe other historical stories that don't have anywhere near as much historical testimony 
in their favor. Not exactly. It's, it's inconsistent to do that. Okay, let's look at some of the claims Jesus himself made because those are fascinating. I mean, obviously, one of one of the, my favorite ones was obviously at the at the woman at the well. He actually came out right, and I think that was unique, if I'm correct, when he actually revealed himself as the Messiah uh, to the woman at the well. Um, yeah, he never he never came out and said he was the Messiah in any other situation. Uh, except when he asked his disciples, who do you say I am, yeah. in a private meeting, and Peter said, you're the Christ, or the Messiah, and, he's, and he, he said, well, the Father has revealed that to you. So he, he basically acknowledged it there. And then the only other time was when he was on trial, and the high priest put him under oath and said, are you the Messiah, or not? And Jesus said, I am. So there's times when he admitted it, uh, but not very many. I mean, Jesus did not go, in none of those situations was it a public problem. Proclamation. Jesus never went out in the street and told, "Hey, I'm the Messiah." He never made that claim publicly. Yeah. Um, okay. We, I mean, we we say the Messiah, but obviously, um, in the context of who he was talking to, the woman at the well, the Sanhedrin, uh, they they weren't necessarily expecting the Messiah to be actually God Himself. Where they were expecting a divinity right. deliverer. So, what are the pastures for you or, or for our listeners? about the claims that Jesus himself made that, that would pertain and lead us to believe that, that, that he was claiming to be God. Jesus kept his cards pretty close to his chest about things like this. Like I said, he, heart, he never even proclaimed publicly that he was Messiah, which is a much more modest claim than claiming to be God. Uh, he basically wanted people to figure it out. He wanted God to reveal it to them rather than him blow his own horn. But he was glad when they saw it, you know. He was glad when Peter said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He said, oh, blessed are you, Simon, because, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father has. Uh, I don't think Jesus went around saying an awful lot about being God or being Messiah or even being the Son of God, though he did on occasion say things about that, which make it very clear that that's how he understood himself. Why he didn't proclaim it more is hard to say, but then there's lots of things Jesus did hard to say, like when he'd do a great miracle, he tell people, don't tell anyone about this. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's so counter what we would do. We do the opposite. So Jesus was obviously trying to avoid making a big splash. He was not trying to make a big movement uh, based on him. He was really leaving things in the hands of God. Jesus was out doing what he should do and leaving it to his father to open the eyes of people to know who he was. But did he say things that indicated he was God? Yes. Yes, he did. Um Probably the, the clearest claim he made was in uh, John 8:58, where Jesus was in a dispute with the Jewish leaders, and uh, and he said to them, "Before Abraham was, I am." Yeah. Now that's not good grammar. No, that's that's just not good grammar. It should be before Abraham was, I was, or I have been, or something like that. But he said, "Before Abraham was, I am." Now, why did he say I am? Well, because that was a title, or a, we could say a name, that the Jews knew to belong to God. Now, some people, some Christians say, he was quoting the name of God given to Moses at the burning bush. Because at the burning bush, when Moses first met God, Moses said, what is your name? And God said, I am that I am. You go tell the children of Israel that I am has sent you. So we see God identifying him, his name as I am. However, in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, it does not, when, when God says to, to Moses, I am, he does not, it, the Greek does not use the same terms that Jesus used when he said, I am. Yeah, because uh, if I'm correct, in John 8, it, it, it's ego e me, isn't it? Is that ego e me, yes. Uh -huh. two, two Greek words, ego, which is like ego, E-G-O, that's where Freud got the ego idea. Ego means I am. And the other one? Oh, no, it means I. It means I. Ego means I. And a me means I am. Uh -huh. Now, even without the ego, if you just have the word a me, yeah. it means I am. When you put ego, which means I, before it, it's like saying I, I am. Right. But the, it's just an, it's an emphatic way of saying I am. Mm. But again, the question is, why didn't he say it in the past tense? Why didn't he say before Abram was, I was? Why do you say I am? And it's obvious that he's paying no attention to grammar in using that term. 
because he's using a technical term, a, a name, a proper name, I am. Now, again, he was not quoting the name of God from Exodus 3.14, where God told, Mo, uh, told Moses, my name is I am. Because there, the Greek terms in the Septuagint at Exodus 3.14 are, before uh, he says, uh, I am the existing one. Right. Uh, I am the existing one. Now, in the Hebrew, he said, I am, but in the Greek text, it says the existing one. Now, if, if the Greek New Testament writers wanted to make it clear that Jesus was quoting the burning bush statement, they would have used the same Greek term that the Greek Old Testament used, but they didn't. They chose something else, but what they did choose was a fairly common term from Isaiah, which is always applied to God. And uh, there's a great number of names of God in the Bible, but there is one particular way that God identified himself repeatedly in the book of Isaiah. And, for example, in Isaiah 41, verse 4, he says, God says, Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh, am the first, and with the last, I am. Yeah. And in, the, in the Greek, that's ego eimi, the same thing that Jesus said. Now, it sounds like an incomplete sentence to say, I am, but that's, that's just what God's calling us, is, I am. And if you look over at Isaiah 43, 10, he uses this again in an interesting way. Isaiah 43, 10 says, you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. That's his ego, a me. And then he says uh, in verse 13, before the day was, I am. That is ego eimi, the same term that Jesus used. Now, what's interesting about uh, uh, Isaiah 43, 13, God, the structure of the sentence is similar to the structure of Jesus' sentence. Yeah. Before, before Abraham was, I am, or before the day was, I am, you'd expect God to say, before the day was, I was. But he says, I am. He used the same strange uh, departure. Yeah. from normal grammar that Jesus used. So you have, you have Jesus claiming to be the God, uh, uh, you know, the, the God of Israel in the Old Testament. Interestingly, in 41, that one you mentioned, 41.4, uh, yeah. if I'm correct, it, it, earlier in that verse, he, he, he's t it, it's referred to the first and with the last, which Jesus yeah. is also referred to in Revelation. Right. In Revelation, he calls himself the first and the last. Yeah. Uh, and in, in Isaiah 46.4, Using that ego a me again, God says this, even to your old age, I am. And even to your gray hairs, I will carry you. Now, when he says even to your old age, he's talking about something future. But he still sticks with the I am in the, in the, sing, in the present. And it's ego a me there. So you see that throughout this section of Isaiah, God keeps referring to himself as, the, as I am. And even in a sentence where you'd expect a past tense, he doesn't change it. It's still I am. Yeah, or a sentence where you expect... Or where you expect the future tense, he he doesn't change it. It's it's I am, and so when Jesus said before Abraham was I am, and he uses the same phrase ego I me that God used in these cases, it was very clear that he's saying I am, the one that said these I am things to you in yeah, Isaiah, so, which was so, Yahweh. Which is why they picked now, up stones for blasphemy, wasn't it? Yeah, they took up stones to throw at him to kill him because they understood that he was making himself God. Now they did that on other occasions too. But like I say, Jesus did not very. Jesus never came right out and said, "I am God." Uh, first of all, that would have been extremely dangerous to say in a Jewish setting. But but he said things that were hints, and he left it up to God to show to open people's eyes and hearts to understand that that's who he was. And I think that's still how people discover it. I mean, you can't argue somebody into believing that Jesus is God if they don't want to believe it. But God Himself can open their hearts and open their eyes to, to see that his claims, first of all, could be understood no other way. And secondly, that his claims were true. Yeah. And that's that's how the disciples of Jesus differed from the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't believe his claims were true, and the disciples did. And the difference was that the Pharisees were stuck in their own philosophy and presuppositions, and the disciples were open-minded, and God was able to get through to them. Yeah, and the Pharisees were wicked on their own agenda as well, of course, and he was a nuisance. Um, well, the fact that they plotted to kill Jesus when he'd done nothing, no crimes makes it clear how wicked they were, yeah. 
And, and also, it's worth noting that in the end, that was the reason that they were able to go to the Romans because they pushed hard for it, and Pilate could see no reason. To, you know, to, there's no guider and there's no wickedness in this man that would cause me to kill him. In the end, the reason that they were able to get because when he when he stood up in front of Caiaphas, he said, "You shall see the Son of Man," which is another title, "Son of Man coming in yep. the clouds." And so they were able. Uh, in other words, they were they be ripped his, his uh, vestment as a sign of blasphemy and with no more need right. witnesses. So they were able to go to the Romans and say, "He's claiming to be God. We've got it. We've got to kill him." Yeah, that's what they. That's they. They understood very well that he was claiming to be God, and he never backed down from that. No. You know, and then of course the disciples who walked with him spoke of him as God in their later writings too, mm. and and when you think about it, if Jesus didn't claim to be God there would certainly be no reason for his disciples to make that claim for him for the simple reason that they were Jewish. I mean, we're not talking about uh, Greeks who believed in the gods of Mount Olympus who come down and visit men and, and, and walk around men and, and, and so forth. Uh, these were Jews. <laughs> these Jews believed in an invisible God. They, they were very jealous over their Jewish doctrine that there's only one God, not more than one, and that he's not a man. So for these Jewish guys... Shortly after Jesus had died and risen again, for them to go around saying, "You know, Jesus is God," yeah. is uh, th that would not be intuitive for them. That would not be something they would necessarily even just conclude from him rising from the dead. Other people rose from the dead. Uh, Lazarus did, but no one thought he was God. Of course, Jesus made Lazarus rise from the dead, and and Jesus made himself rise from the dead, yeah. which you says make, a lot. You make it yourself rise from the dead is a different, different thing from raising yeah. someone else. <laughs> That's right. And, but, you know, just because a man rises from the dead, what does that prove? Well, it proves at least something. It proves there's something supernatural going on, but it doesn't necessarily prove he's God. I mean, it could be some other explanation. But the disciples all understood that he was God, and they must have gotten that from him because there's no reason why they would have made that up. It, after all, they were started, they were preaching their message in a Jewish setting for the first several years, and they didn't even have it in their head they were going to go out to non-Jews initially. It, that came about later sort of unexpectedly to them. And in a Jewish world, you're not going to get very much headway by telling people that a man is God. That's just too offensive to Jews. And yet they did. And the only reason they were able to convince people is because, like, like as in Peter's case, God revealed it to them. I mean, when people's eyes were opened, uh, they could see it. And also, of course, the miracles that were done by the apostles tended to give their story a supernatural uh, yeah, I mean, confirmation. I mean, someone you know, someone rising from the dead, you know, maybe after um, I don't know a few hours or something, you might be able to negotiate. But Jesus was dead for three days. Yeah. You know, I, I, that is to me. Uh, maybe I'm not thinking correctly, but I don't know. To me, that that you know, and there was no one involved, you know, in raising him. That's the difference. That's the difference. Yeah, when Laz Lazarus rose out for four days, but Jesus was there to raise him. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing Jesus said, uh, which is an interesting passage, is in John 14, when the apostles came to him and said, um, uh, can, you show us the you know, can you show us the Father? And Jesus said, um, have, I been long, have I been so long with you and you still not, do not know me? Whosoever has seen uh, the Father, uh, how can you say show us the Father? Or sorry, who, 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 who have ever seen me, rather? So Jesus was basically saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, when they asked him to, you know, to, to reveal the Father. Yeah. Um, because obviously you've got this strange relationship going on between Jesus is God, but he's not the Father. And, uh, you know, well, yeah, that's, that's a lot of people who, uh, who like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and people like that, who, who call themselves Christians, but don't, they don't believe Jesus is God. They like to point out that he always referred to himself uh, as the son of God. And if he's the son, which he didn't very often, once in a while he did. He usually called himself the son of man, actually. But yeah, uh, they, they, they say, you know, since he called himself the son of God, he's not claiming to be God. Well, you might as well say because he called himself the son of man, he wasn't claiming to be man. You know, I mean, uh, the son of man is man and the son of God is God. And uh, the truth is that Jesus had no difficulty referring to God as his father, even in the very passage you mentioned, where, where he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Uh, in another place, he said, the father and I are one in John 10, 30 or 31. And even in the passage you were talking about in chapter 14 of John, 
after he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, uh, he says, do you not believe, verse 10, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now, that's a really strange statement to make. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Yeah, it is, yeah. Well, okay, so he's makes, he makes a distinction between the Father and himself, and yet they're in each other, mm. inside each other. Now, if I say I am in my office, well, I'm making a, an intelligible statement. If I say my office is in me, well, I don't know exactly how that would be understood, but uh, you might, it might just mean I'm familiar with my office or, you know, I've got a picture of it in my head or something. But when Jesus said he's in the Father and the Father is in him, he's talking about some admixture. Uh, that is not, he doesn't go so far as to explain it. But later in the same chapter, he says, the Father is greater than I, which is a strange thing for him to say after he's already said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, then the Father's greater than I. Isn't he kind of contradicting himself? Well, he didn't think so. So he obviously understood things in such a way that allows him to make a distinguishment between himself and his Father, to see the Father is greater than him, and yet he is in the Father and the Father in him in such a way that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. What, how does all that work out? The, you know, it's interesting that the Bible, although it makes, you know, it presupposes this mixture of the God head, you know, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, it never explains it, leaving it up to us to either just accept it as an inexplic inexplicable mystery or, or to think of some way to explain it ourselves. And theologians have done their best to try to explain it in various ways, and I have too, but no one can really know if their explanation is the correct explanation. The main thing we know is that the Bible says that Jesus is God and that the Father is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God, but there's only one God. So somehow all three of these are the one God. And I, you know, in saying that Jesus is in the Father and the Father's in him, I, I often resort to metaphors using liquids because you can mix liquids together and they are intermixed. You know, if you put, if you put uh, lemon and honey in, in water, as I did actually this, this, uh, this mug I'm holding had hot water and lemon and honey in it for my throat. Uh, well, lemon and honey and water, they're all liquids, but they have different properties. I mean, the water has different properties than the lemon juice, and lemon juice has different properties than, than honey, but they can all be intermixed. If they're mixed together, they are in each other. The lemon is in the water, the water is in the honey, the honey's in the lemon, and the, you know, they're all in each other yeah. because they're intermixed like liquids intermixed. Now, I don't know if this analogy works, except that the Bible says that God is a spirit. And since we don't understand much about spirit, uh, the Bible gives us analogies like water and oil and things like that as images of the spirit. So it may be that although the spiritual things are not physical and therefore are not really liquid, it may be that in our physical world, liquids have properties that are more analogous to, to uh, spiritual things than maybe solids would. And if we t think of it that way, think if I... Think if I had made this mug before I came here and it was it had lemon juice and honey and hot water for my throat. And, and my wife said, you know, is that, you know, what does that taste like? I could pour a little bit of it out into a little glass and she, she could taste it. I say, that's what it is. You, you've just tasted it. You've tasted what's in this big mug, but you've only tasted a little sample of it. Yeah. But it's all mixed together. It's all one. It's you still, know, I mean, it's still the same stuff, yeah. So Jesus, Jesus could say, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, but the Father is really greater than I am. He's bigger. I'm just a, I'm just a container here on earth. Sam, you, I'm, you can sample God yeah. from your access to me, you know. And, uh, but I, I think of it, I often think of it kind of child, childish illustrations because my children used to ask these questions. So I'd try to give answers that they would like. And then when I grew up, that, you know, the childish explanations sometimes make more sense to me than the ones theologians give. Like, you know, the illustration I w would give my children sometimes is that if we had a, uh, a gold, uh, some goldfish in a bowl and they couldn't see out because every time they looked at the, the side of the bowl, they just saw their own reflection. Right. They don't know anything ab about the world outside. They only know their world. There's this little ceramic uh, building in there they can swim through and uh, a, sh a sunken ship and a uh, you know, some uh, maybe sea, some, some water plants growing in there. That's all they know. The whole world they know is right there. They don't know there's a world outside. 
But they do know that from time to time, uh, there's uh, this sprinkling of food on the surface of their world, and they go up and they eat it. Uh, and then the next day, there's some sprinkling of food there too. Now, I'm putting the food there. They don't know that because they've never seen me. But, you know, maybe one fish speculates that somebody's out there putting that there. And another fish speculates, no, that's just nature produces that stuff. Well, obviously, this would be comparable to a person who's a theist or an atheist uh, trying to make sense of the things that are provided in this world for us. Well, what if, the, what, if the, what if I then at some point stuck my finger down into the water and, and, uh, and, and, and the fish let me pet it, you know? Yeah. It would be experiencing me, not much of me, mm. only my finger. Yeah. But that's me, you know? I mean, I have invaded their world. I have made contact with them. Yeah. And they only are seeing this finger. But there's a lot more out there besides what they're seeing. Yeah, those are uh, those are interesting analogies. I, I must admit, a while ago, I, 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 you know, even though it's almost impossible, the, the, the mind just seems to want to, you know, intuitively try and come up with ideas. I, I, I in the end, I tend to resist it because I, I sort of went around in so many circles with it. I just kind of thought, and I know you, you're, you're the same. I mean, some, we just got to sometimes put our hands up and say. It's, it's just a mystery that it is, it, you know, the Bible affirms it, but doesn't explain it. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's just a mysterious thing that we um, hope maybe we'll know more about it uh, in, in, in heaven or whatever. But, you know, it's uh, certainly a mystery. But, um, but of course, as you know, as well, you know, because of human reason, we have lots of people rejecting it. I don't understand it. Therefore, I'm going to reject it. Whereas that's not really good grounds to reject something. It, 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 of course, can be true, and we believe it is true, just because we can't fully uh, articulate it. Well, we, we believe all kinds of things we don't understand, uh, and we use them too. I mean, somebody out there understands how electricity works, but I don't. I have no, I have no training in electrical things, but it doesn't prevent me from being able to use the electricity in my house. I know it's there. I don't know how. I don't know why. I mean, I know something about how switches work and why you know you you break a curtain or, or you know create a current, but I, I don't know where the I don't know the properties of electricity. It's just not my forte, uh, but it doesn't prevent me from believing in it and believing that some people out there may understand it better than I do. And certainly, fortunately, some people do. But I mean, everybody everybody believes that there are atoms. Nobody has ever seen an atom. Even even atomic scientists have not seen an atom. But everybody believes that atoms are made up of a nucleus, made up of protons and neutrons clustered together and, and circled by electrons. Uh, I, I don't think anyone in the world doesn't believe that, even though it's never been proven or shown. But it's been demonstrated experimentally, but it hasn't been seen. And certainly, I've never conducted the experiments. I trust somebody else who has, that they, they must know what they're talking about. Because if you're trying to prove the existence of atoms by me, uh, I'd be at a loss. I, I I wouldn't know how to prove it at all. I don't even know how they prove it, but I do accept it. Yeah, yeah. Just knowing that some people know more than I do about these things, and I'm and I'm just trusting that they are the ones who know, as opposed to someone who's just shooting off their their mouth and don't know a thing. But but there are things even about the atoms that even the nuclear scientists can't tell you why. Why do the protons clustered at the nucleus of the atom not repel each other? They all have a positive charge, and a positive positive charges repel each other they don't cling together yeah and also uh, also qu quantum mechanics uh, w w you, you could apply that type of thing to the trinity because you've got the same two cells it's it's the same cell as in two different places yeah i know that uh, yeah quantum physics i think has really thrown a wrench into uh physician uh, phys physics uh, studies uh as far as thinking that we can really understand everything it's it really seems to make things more random than we thought they were. Yeah, and it seems that it doesn't marry up with uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, does it? So uh, as far as I know, the state of physics is, a, is in a state of quandary because, the, uh, am I right, is it, it quantum mechanics and Einstein's... Um... I, I, now, I, I have to say, as much as I've read of Einstein, he's above my pay grade. And I don't really know that Einstein is would be contrary to quantum physics, but he might be. I know that Einstein Einstein came up with ideas that Newton uh, they they contradict Newton. But I, I you know as far as quantum physics, I'm not so sure that Einstein was uh, con thought contrary to that. I, Maybe I, I uh, 
I, I'm outside my I'm, out, I'm outside my realm here. Not that yeah. I understand either, of it, but I I I thought there was a, 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 the world of physics have come into a state of flux because of the difficulties marrying up Einstein's theory of relativity and 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 the, and the the basis of the, you know of quantum mechanics. But again, I, you know, like yourself, I don't really know enough about it. Um, just very quickly, Steve, another very common you know point of contention on which you hear with a lot of people and possibly within our listeners. The whole idea of Jesus was decided at the Council of Nicaea. Now, we know that's nonsense, but if you, I know you're short for time, but just if you could summarize how uh, the idea that Jesus was accepted long before Nicaea, and that Nicaea did not come up with something. You mean, you mean as God? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, I mean, you can see that easily enough by just reading what the apostles wrote in our, in our Bibles. They lived a long time before Nicaea. The, uh, the Council of Nicaea was in 325 AD, and it was convened because not everybody was accepting that Jesus was God, though the mainstream Christians had accepted that for a very long time. It's a little bit like the Jehovah's Witnesses arose in the 1800s to say Jesus isn't God, although Christians have always been saying that he was. Uh, so there was a group called the Arians that arose in the third century that said that Jesus wasn't God. Well, the reason there was a council is because most Christians disagreed. Most Christians said he was God, and the Arians were challenging the status quo. And so a council was convened, the Nicene Council, and it was decided uh, after all, all the arguments were heard that, in fact, those who believed Jesus were God, was God had the scriptures on their side. Uh, now, what's interesting, some people try to make it out that Constantine was somehow making... Uh, the decision that Jesus would be viewed as a god, like the Romans have these gods that, to worship. But Constantine didn't uh, make the decision, the bishops did, and the council almost made the opposite decision. The Arians, who were disputing and saying God was that Jesus is not God, uh, over the course of the long proceedings, there was a time when the Arians almost won the day. But the argument turned, uh, you know, through a man named Athanasius, another direction, and eventually it was concluded that the evidence for him being God was more favorable. And, and it was, so, it was, I mean, it was in the favor of Jesus being God in the end, comprehensively. It wasn't a close call in the end, was it? Well, yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't think it was just a majority vote. I think it was, it was largely a unanimous. But, but, but there, were, there were still Aryan churches throughout the Roman Empire for some time. But, uh, but the thing is that the, the bishops of the mainstream churches... <clears throat> Had, uh, had pretty much always, most of them had always believed Jesus was God from the earliest times because that's what the Bible actually says. Yeah. And the Bible was written 300 years before Nicene Council. Right. So they didn't, you know, it's not like the Nicene Council came up with the idea that Jesus is God. You find it taught by Irenaeus 150 years before the Nicene Council. And you find it taught in Paul 300 years before the Nicene Council. Just the martyr and the rest of them? Yeah, those guys... Those guys were teaching that long before there was an Nicene Creed or an Nicene Council. The council was simply was not there to establish a new doctrine. The council was there to defend, if possible, the, the historic understanding of the church with uh, a contending version of the Arians. And as I say, the council was apparently open-minded enough to almost be persuaded of Arianism. But then the, they felt the evidence went the other direction and ended up supporting Jesus as God. So... <coughs> I'm actually kind of glad, in a way, that they almost went Aryan because that just shows it wasn't a stacked deck. It's not, you know, they, they didn't all go in there with a fore, foregone conclusion. This council is just going to put a rubber stamp but, on our view that but, Jesus is God. They almost were persuaded otherwise. Yeah, because otherwise you could suspect an agenda and a, and, uh, and a conspiracy to sort of um, use it for, well, use it for what people accused it of being, you know? Um, yeah. A control mechanism. Steve. I think we're out of time. We've been, it's, we've, we've been on just over. Yeah, yeah, we are pretty much out of time, yeah. You've got, you've already had a, done some stuff this morning. You've got a Bible study this evening, as you said. So um, thanks very much for coming on. It's lovely to see you again. And um, I'll let you get on with it then. I've, okay, thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, now, when do you, when do you uh, post this? I'll, well, I, well I, t I mean, I tend to, um, 